Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 147 and at Orthopedic Principles. We are back with our spectacular faculty, Dr. Robbie Ray from London, United Kingdom. Robbie is a nationally, internationally board certified orthopedic foot and ankle and Toronto, Canada. Robbie was awarded the BOFUS Gold. The focus of his research is based around elective and trauma foot and ankle surgery. He's currently consultant at the King's College Hospital Foundation Trust. Today, it's my honor to bring back Mr. Robbie Ray for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Robbie. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having me back. So last time we talked a bit about forefoot conditions. Today, I'd like to speak to you about a special interest of mine, which is the adult acquired flat foot deformity. I'm gonna give you some background, some history, go through some stuff for the exam, including examination and some tips and tricks, and then go into some of the details of modern adult flat foot reconstruction and how things are changing. So first of all, I want to go through some terminology. There's a few different terms, um, posterior tibial tendon deficiency, adult acquired flat foot. And I'm going to explain why I prefer the term adult acquired flat foot and also show you some of the other things that can fall into that category. As always, it's important to understand anatomy and pathoanatomy and how that affects biomechanics. From there, I'm going to go into classification because the classification is based on the anatomy and also the classification is based on how people viewed the pathology and how that view has been moving forward. So I think we should do that before we do assessment and diagnostics. And once we get an idea of what people think about adult acquired flat foot, we'll do the assessments and diagnosis. And finally, we'll do, go through quite a detailed management of flat foot deformity. So first of all, why call it adult acquired flat foot? Why not call it posterior tibial tendon disorder, dysfunction, deficiency? There's two reasons. The second of which we'll get into later, which is, is the tendon the most important thing in this disorder? But more importantly, adult acquired flat foot isn't always the condition we think it is of hind foot tendon deficiency flat foot. You can get a flat foot in a case like this where the problem is actually midfoot arthritis and midfoot collapse. From there, there's more rare and complex conditions we need to look out for. This is something called Muller Weiss syndrome, Muller Weiss. And that is an adult onset avascular necrosis of the lateral pole of the, patel, of the navicular. Again, this can present with an adult acquired flat foot, nothing to do with tip post. Even a complex charcoal deformity with complete midfoot collapse can look like an adult acquired flat foot. So that's one of the reasons. It's important to know the anatomy. There's the tib post, which comes down behind the tibia, attaches onto the navicular. And then there's all these ligaments, including the spring ligament, the deltoid ligament. You can draw them out very nicely and make them all look like separate structures. But really, when you look at a foot cadaver, you can see that really it's a sleeve of tissue that, is, that supports the medial arch. So there's the, significant structures, the tib post tendon, the plantar fascia, but there's also the sling of tendon, including the deep and superficial deltoid, the calcaneonavicular spring ligament, and then fibers of tib post and other plantar ligaments that make up the medial arch. And I've kind of I've focused on that because we're going to go into how those medial ligaments are part of the disease process later on. Looking at biomechanics, the Plantar fascia plays quite a role in maintaining the arch. One of the tests is the sort of windlass mechanism test where you dorsiflex a big toe, it tensions the plantar fascia and causes an arch. Um, I never really knew what the windlass meant and this here is a windlass. A windlass is something from a sailing boat and it's a drum around which you wind a, sail, wind a, a rope which tightens the sail. And that's kind of similar to what happens, this is the original diagram from the description of the, um, the plantar structure. So really, as the big toe lifts off the ground, it works like winding the string around a, dirt, a drum, tightens the plantar fascia. So the plantar fascia makes the arch by tightening. And this is where the biomechanics comes in. So 
as we tore off, as we can see here, it tightens the plantar fascia. That has an effect on pulling the heel inwards. And as the heel pulls inwards, it supinates the subtalar joint, causing this joint to lock. On the left side, as we see here, this is what's happening. The right side has deformity and is not locking. So this basic knowledge of what the plantar fascia does, what the um, heel does, the subtalar joint does, and also what the Achilles tendon does in locking this joint is important in normal mobilization, normal gait. And as these things are thrown off in flat foot deformity and we start um, loading through abnormal parts of the, the hind foot, it becomes a progressive cycle of disorder and deformity. When we look at the biomechanics, there's a calcaneocuboid axis and tail navicular axis. When we're standing flat, the keels are evert everted and this um, joint is pronated, it's mobile. As you go on tiptoes, they come convergent and become a stiff joint. We can see it here, neutral calcaneus, they're parallel, inverted calcaneus, the joints start to converge as we've seen on the right picture. And this leads to a state where the joint locks and we use this when we're mobilizing forward. So when we've got a flat foot deformity, we're unable to mobilize over the joints and um, we end up with a, a weak foot. We'll come back, we'll, we'll bring all that together as we talk about the disease processes moving forward. But just, to, I, th I think at this point, having the anatomy, I'd like to go over the classification of adult acquired flat foot, because I think that the classification is kind of historical and it sets out what we need to examine for. So initially, the a disease process, tibialis posterior tendon dysfunction, was described by uh, Johnson and Strong. They initially had a case report, then they had a case series, and finally they came up with a, a three-point, a three-stage classification. The first stage was peritendinous degeneration. This moved on to elongation of the tendon with a mobile valgus deformity and finally a fixed valgus deformity. The important things that I noted from this original paper, they actually picked up a lot of things that haven't changed very much in 30 or 40 years. So one is from stage one to stage two, you go from normal alignment to a valgus alignment. They also noted that, and this is really quite interesting, that in stage three, you start to get lateral pain because as the position becomes fixed, you get more impingement at the subtalar region. They noticed the too many toes sign with forefoot abduction. So not only did they notice the valgus that comes from heel valgus, they also noticed forefoot abduction, which we need to discuss in detail a bit later. And they also came up with a treatment plan, which would be the FDL to tip post tendon transfer, which is still the most common procedure for flat foot today. So that was the original classification. And those were the two conditions they did, which were a tendon transfer or subtalar orthodesis. But things have moved on since the 80s. And a lot of it's due to the innovation concerning this man, and uh, not me, Mark Myerson. So Mark Myerson is a really well-known uh, senior American foot and ankle surgeon. And he's come up with a lot of papers on flat foot. One of the first ones was this one. Um, the treatment of stage two tibbles with the FDL transfer and the calcaneal osteotomy. So he found that doing the tendon transfer itself, he wasn't getting really good results and decided that by changing the biomechanics with a calcaneal osteotomy, would it improve his results? And it significantly did. He also added the stage four to the classification of pain, flexible and fixed, which is... Uh, involvement of the tibiotalar ankle joint. And this can be a flexible or a fixed involvement, which again, we'll go into when we go into management. So the sort of highlight of Morrison's work on tib post rupture was to revisit the Johnston Strom classification and come up with a much more detailed classification. And this is kind of what I use for the basis of my management. So in stage one, you've got an inflamed tib post tendon 
with no or very little uh, sorry, heel valgus. Stage two, you've got obvious heel val valgus with or without this thing called four foot varus or four foot supination. Um, yes. And stage two B, more than supination, you've got four foot abduction. And stage two C with TMT instability. When we go into the examination section, I'm going to go through these specific findings because now that we know this is what we're looking for, these are the things we have to look out for in examination. Stage three is not really changed a lot. It's a rigid heel valgus. Um, he also had stage B where not only have you got a fixed hind foot that's stiff, you've also got medial column problems such as collapse, uh, instability that needs to be dealt with. And stage four is the most complex stage where you've got all these problems along with problems at the ankle joint as well. So now that we've got an idea of the classification, I want to go back a step into examination. So the reason I've put a shoulder up here is when I was training, I was always told the best way to examine the shoulders from the back. You get the most information on the alignment of the shoulders, the movement of the scapulas. And to be honest, it's the same with the foot, foot and ankle. I'd always start with a posterior examination. So first thing you're doing is you're looking from the back, you're looking at the position of the heels. You can draw on a line, a mid calcaneal line, a mid Achilles line. Let's see, this is an obvious heel valgus. You've got a heel valgus or not. First thing I do is go to tiptoes. You do a tiptoe test, Again, it shows you whether the hind foot is able to cor correct or not. Now, in a very, um, in somebody that's got a, well, this is about adult acquired flat foot, but say you've got pediatric, you've got a tarsal coalition, maybe when they go up on tiptoes, there's no varizing force of the heel at all. But more importantly, in early tib post where there's pain, deficiency of the medial structures, is to do double leg heel raise and then multiple single leg heel raises. Early fatigue is a good sign of the stage one, which is problems with the tip post tendon itself. This thing here, so this is different to heel valgus, right? So think of heel valgus being this idea that the heel is pointing out the way. Too many toes is forefoot abduction or midfoot abduction. So what we're looking at here is the fact that no matter where the foot is positioned, the front of the foot is out further. This patient here, you can see on the right side, has got both heel valgus and forefoot abduction. And when you look at it from the front, you can see that the foot is not pointing straight, but actually pointing out the way. And this is from the back. So, you know, it's a clear sign that it's the, the, you know, the entire foot is collapsing around that talus. That's most of what we can do just from visual inspection. And the first clinical examination, it's the same in any foot and ankle exam. It's what's called the silver skulls test, which is a test of the um, Achilles tendon and posterior structures. Now, the thing to note here is on the left in the straight position, there is the gastric nemius muscle, which attaches to the femoral condyles, crosses two joints. So when you've got a straight knee, you're stretching your gastric nemius and tightness with a straight knee is tightness of mainly the gastrocnemius. It doesn't tell us much about whether the soleus and Achilles is also tight. When we bend the knee, like the situation on the right, you can see that the gastrox is now loose, no longer under tension. So if there's equal tightness with a bent knee, then the entire Achilles is tight or the soleus is tight. Whereas if it's more tight on this straight position, it's a gastroc tightness. Personally, I like to start with a bent knee and straighten out but both are valid ways of doing the test. Straight knee tightness, not so tight when bent, is gastrocnemius tightness. Tightness both straight and bent is soleus Achilles tightness. The tibialis posterior tendon is a structure we need to assess, so we need to know where it is. It travels in a groove just behind the medial malleolus. You can draw on and palpate it. Similarly, you want to actually physically examine this structure by putting it under tension. So something I, I do is, I bring the foot into maximum uh, tension of that tendon. So for tib post, that's full plantar flexion, full inversion. And basically tell the patient, can you hold your foot in this position and try to stretch the position out of it? I find patients are much better at holding positions than trying to draw positions. So rather than saying, can you bend your foot down and in, or can you plantar flex and maximally invert, invert? I just put the foot in that position, say, hold it there, 
and resist against it. And I get, and while my other hand, unlike this person's hand, would be on the tendon itself and let me know if it's painful or difficult. So we can assess the heel, that's good. We can assess the tib post. But when we looked at the anatomy, we noted that in the medial side, it's not just tib post, right? There's a huge sling of ligaments here. And how important is that ligament is um, stability, the deltoid and spring ligaments and plantar ligaments. How do we, can we assess them? So there, there's a chap called Chandra Pashkupar um, in North England, and he did quite a lot of studies. We'll look at his papers as we look at the management on integrity of the spring ligament. And he found that spring ligament integrity was actually more important to biomechanical strength than tip post integrity. And he's come up with this test, the lateral tilt test. So if you hold somebody with pes planus like this flat and just put a moderate force um, for, with your right hand in this picture, you shouldn't get much translation laterally. If you get more than two centimeters of lateral, uh, translation, it pretty much signifies a tear of the spring ligament. And this is something to manage. So a lateral tilt test of the midfoot is a good way to assess for spring ligament and also tenderness in that region. As we move down the foot, we need to look for this thing called forefoot varus, forefoot supination. So how to explain this to you? When you're standing with a varus, uh, sorry, valgus heel, if your foot was in a normal position, it would be dragging on the floor. So to naturally flatten out your foot, what your foot does is over time, it builds in a compensatory supination. So as the heel swung around, the rest of the foot changes position so it can sit flat on the ground. When you correct the valgus abduction, everything else, and you pull the heel into neutral, you find that the foot, rather than being flat, is now at this odd angle. Uh, Myerson talks about putting the foot into quinus to see if it corrects it. Personally, I just press on the fifth metatarsal to see if, I, if that gentle rocking motion will correct the supination. If it does, the patient will generally walk it out. If, however, it stays in that position, it's quite stiff, you want to think of a medial column procedure, such as a lap diffusion or cotton osteotomy. The difference between those is if you've got TMT instability or a sort of big bunion deformity the patient's also unhappy with, I'd rather correct everything through a lap diffusion. If, however, they don't have those problems, and it's mainly the supination, I would do a cotton osteotomy. I'll describe those procedures to you a bit later on. We're orthopedic surgeons, we like x-rays, so it's worth having a look at some x-ray measurements. There's three here. A is the Mary's angle. Basically, it should be straight. A line going straight through the tail should go straight through the first metatarsal. As you get flat foot, you get an increasing break in that angle, and you can see the tail is going down the way and the metatarsal is coming straight across. B is the calcaneal pitch. As the Achilles gets tight, moves lateral, you get quinus, the pitch flattens out as the Achilles raises. And as you lose your ligamentous and tendinous integrity on the medial column, you get what's called a cuneiform drop. Not a commonly measured thing, but that's what C is. It's also important to look at the AP foot. The, the talus and the navicular should be almost symmetrical. We've drawn about three degrees here. Really, they should look like they're pretty boxed in together. As you get a flat foot deformity, the talus moves down and in. The entire foot starts to slide around it. This is what's called the abduction deformity. And you can draw, and draw an angle here by, by drawing across the um, head of the talus and, the, uh, and, and, the, and the, the, the joint of the talus and the joint of the navicular, basically. So this, this line here is the one edge of the head, other edge of the head. And this one here is edge of the navicular, edge of the navicular. And this gives you a sort of angle, you know, at 90 degrees to that and also gives you an uncoverage. So I'm more interested in this uncoverage. And for me, this is more of a visual thing, although these angles are available. I'll look at this to see how much uncoverage there is, because if there's excessive uncoverage, more than talking 40, 50%, then we're looking at different procedures to correct the abduction, which we'll get to when we talk, talk about procedures. But it is important to look at that uncoverage. It's important to look at the lateral x-ray clearly and just get an idea of where is the thing collapsing? Because classic tip post dysfunction, tendinopathy, you always think it's in the, the talus will declinate, the collapse will be at the tail and navicular joint. But as I was saying, this sling of medial structures is quite important. 
So the claps can be anywhere in the foot. And if you look at this one here, they've, they've drawn the lines on it as if it's a, a clear Mary's angle drop. But really, the apex of this is not the tail of the navicular joint. It's here, the, the navicular cuneiform navicular cuneiform joint. So your corrective procedures, if you want to get the best result, should be focused on trying to correct here rather than purely collecting at the tail navicular joint. So then finally, we did talk a bit about lapidus. Looking at your radiographs, you want to check this here. You want to check this plantar gapping. You see this bunion, you see this plantar gapping. If you want to correct this, a lapidus is a way forward, TMT fusion. So let's move on to treatment of flat foot. And as we do treatment, again, we'll go back to classification. Again, we'll go back to assessment. So everything will be brought together for you. The treatment starts with conservative measures. This thing's called the slant board. Really one of the most important things I can stress, foot and ankle pathology, whether it's Achilles, plantar fasciitis, transfer metatarsalgia, forefoot overload, bunions, flat foot. The root of most problems is tight, gastrox, tight Achilles. So that's where we start. Stand on a slant board, it stretches your calves, you move it to be in a, in a better position to give you more stretch. And this is where all re rehabilitation therapy starts. Stretches can be done using a towel as well. I tend to do all these stretches with the aid of a physiotherapist. You can strengthen tip post itself. So here you can see patients got a band on, they're resting on the uh, right position on the I'm looking at my side and on the left picture this one here you can see that they're tensing their tip post in full plantar flexion and inversion so actually strengthening that tendon kinesio taping I'm a big fan of kinesio taping for tendon injuries and um, these things are put under tension it's not something the patient can do themselves because there's a sort of whole science about how tight you want certain parts so that it's um, appropriately tensioning the tendon through whatever function the patient's doing. So I use them to physio for kinesio taping. And then there's orthotics. Orthotics can be very, very simple medial arch supports that you can get from boots. They can be more complex, custom made, such as this UCL brace, or really full foot, you know, bespoke orthotics made for the patient. Really the main things they need is a heel cup and an arch support. You can get to the really complex uh, stage of things. This is called the Ritchie brace. I use this for the grade threes in the elderly patient, somebody that's really not keen on surgery, 80 plus, severe deformity. What this is, this is a custom soft ankle brace with a um, foot orthosis as well. So it straightens out the foot, but it also keeps the ankle straight, so it stops that grade four tibial to the other side. So this can be quite a nice option for an old patient that definitely doesn't want surgery. But we're surgeons, so let's talk about the, the operative treatment. So I'm going to give you an operative algorithm for each and every stage. It's my operative algorithm, but the principles are, are similar. It's just how you're going to approach it and what operations are you going to do. Before I go through step by step, grade by grade, I think I'm going to focus and start by just talking about the different procedures available for the gastroxylaeus Achilles because these procedures are somewhat interchangeable. Some are more powerful than others, and some have more recovery. So the simplest procedure with the least recovery is a proximal medial gastrocnemius release, release one head of the gastrox. This is a good operation because it's quick, low risk, patient can walk on it the same day. So if that's your aim with only a mild to moderate um, increase in gastrox excursion required, that's a good operation. Next ones are sort of mid-substance ones. I do what's called the strayers, but there's also the um, vulpius, the blomen. They're all kind of similar. This one releases the fascia over gastrox and soleus. Again, fairly straightforward. Because of the release of the muscle here, you'd want to protect their weight for at least two weeks so that they don't end up with a muscle tear. So you'd, put, you'd gently stretch them where you want them, put them in a cast for two weeks, and then they can get walking on it. But generally, unless you're doing other procedures that will immobilize the patient, I would prefer the medial pro proximal gastrocnemius release. And finally, there is the Achilles lengthening procedure, such as the Hulk. These are technically really straightforward, but do carry a risk of rupturing the Achilles tendon and require probably six weeks of immobilization. 
So it's fine if you're doing other procedures that will cause six weeks of immobilization, but not ideal as a standalone. Also, um, there are risks of rupturing the Achilles tendon and weakening the, the whole posterior chain. So not so great in a younger patient. So let's go through these in detail. There's a whole bunch of procedures. I want to talk about the Hulk. I want to talk about the Strayer. I want to talk about this proximal medial gastrocnemius release. So the proximal medial gastrocnemius release is a release only of the fascia of the medial head of gastrox. So that starts right up here at the top. I don't make an incision like this. I'll show you the incision in a minute, but basically you get a hold of the medial head. I usually put a little artery clip underneath it. You could use your finger if you made a huge incision like this and just release the fascia, not the muscle. How does it work? Imagine you've got a number of bacons here. So you've got these big bacon steaks. You want to stretch out the bacon, but it won't stretch because it's got that thick rind on it. Imagine the fascia is like that rind. So what we do is we split that rind and you can imagine quite easily the muscle will just split apart as you pull on it. And that's all this procedure is. It's usually done with a little horizontal incision, a centimeter um, in from the medial dimple. We go medial because there's a nerve and vessel that travel on the outside. Go in medial, find the tendon. You can see, you can see the fascia clearly here and then just basically gently slit it and it just gives you a little bit of a stretch. So I said, there's plenty of positives for this operation. The downside is you've got to be almost prone, which is why I don't do it when I'm doing ancillary procedures because it's just a real challenge to get them positioned, do the small operation. You have to close it and turn the whole patient if you're doing anything else. So if I'm doing more stuff, I tend to do a strayer, but as a standalone or just with an arthroscopy, I'll quite frequently just do, do, do this procedure. So the strayer um, is usually done on the inside of the leg. So the medial aspect of the leg, you've got to go back because you're trying to release the superficial compartment. You've got to go four or five centimeters back from the tibia and make an incision, open it up, find the fascia and grab it and start releasing it. Now, I just think this is quite an easy operation, but the bit I hated was right at the bottom of the incision, just when you've got one more bit of fascia to go, that's where the sural nerve comes along, comes along laterally. And you're always worried about getting it, especially if this incision isn't in the correct place. It's quite a far, deep way down. I used to struggle with this a little bit. So that's the sural nerve. So people have described doing this endoscopically, getting a camera in there, doing it under camera. But I mean, look at these images. I still don't get the idea that I'd clearly be able to identify the nerve and, and, um, and do this well. The other thing I found was that a lot of the operations I do for flat feet are on the outside of the leg. And I was speaking to Joel Vernois about this, and he suggested the way that he does the strayer procedure is exactly the same as these pictures here. But he starts on the outside. And after he said to me, I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense. I'll now make the incision on the outside. I find this row nerve, I move it out of the way. And there isn't any significant structures on the medial side of this fascia. So you can really just cut right across it quite easily, quite quickly, without much difficulty. So I'd suggest if you're doing a strayer procedure, Consider doing it from the lateral side, find the nerve and just move it out of the way. Final procedure is the whole Z lengthening. I mean, the, the tips to this are, you want to remember the spiral of the Achilles. It starts medial, medial spirals lateral, comes back medial. So ideally a medial cut, a lateral cut and a medial cut will allow you to stretch out the tendon. I don't really like this procedure. It's quite uncontrolled. There's a high risk of rupturing the tendon. But if you're doing an older person or a diabetic shark or you're doing a grade three, it's very, very quick, carries probably the, the least general risk of blood vessel and nerve injuries to these procedures. And you can do it, stretch them out. If you do have a little bit of a rupture, it'll heal a bit long, but you know, in the right position with time. And generally you're fusing or you're doing lots of operations, they'll be in a cast non-weight brain for six weeks. So it won't cause a noticeable problem. So now that we've got our posterior procedures or proximal medial gastroc release or strayer and our um, hook lengthening. I'm going to talk about the operative procedures uh, by stages. So we think of stage one, if we go right back, stage one was inflammation of the tendon, possibly split tear, plus just a, maybe a, a tiny bit of heel valgus. So for this, they're going to have tight calves. 
and this is I want them moving quickly. So they've tried their conservative measures, their boot, their strapping. So the proximal medial gastroc release is small release, gives them that little bit of extra stretch and doesn't take them off the feet. The described procedure is a tibialis posterior debridement, which we should talk about and discuss how should we do that. And then why has this happened? There must be some form of dynamic malalignment. So we should consider doing some sort of realignment to protect what we're doing gastroc release and tib post debridement way. And whether this is to do with the heel valgus or just a sort of more dynamic problem is something we'll go into here. So tip post debridement, simply, it was held off for a long time because it's almost as big an operation as a medial reconstruction, involved a 10 to 15 centimeter incision, full debridement of the tendon, removal of all the synovitis, stitches, closure, cast, long recovery. I mean, I don't think we should be doing any open tendon debridements anymore, when simply you can do it with an arthroscope. If they've got inflammatory problems in their tip post tendon, you can just go in with a small shaver and clear away all the synovitis. If you do find a small split tear, you can make a one, two centimeter incision and repair it. This is important in two stage, two things. One is early tip post, not so common. The second is inflammatory arthropathy. You get patients who get tip post tendinopathy and synovitis without a flat foot, usually in like psoriatic arthropathies and things. So this can be a really effective treatment here. And I prefer to something like a steroid injection, which can put the tendon at risk. Um, quite straightforward, two portals, go in to bride. Again, exam level guys, there's, there's not a lot of evidence for orthoscopic debridement, endoscopic debridement, but it's just a sensible option. And as long as you make safe portals and are clear of the tendon, this is, this is a good idea. So talk about protecting the position of the foot. You've stretched out a tendon, you've debrided the inflamed to post tendon, you put a stitch in it, and now you're worried that as the patient's mobilizing, they've got excessive pronation of the subtalar joint, which is putting it under strain. This is what it looks like from the top, supinated subtalar joint, neutral and pronated. This is it from the side. You can see as you get to maximal pronation, the lateral process of the talus abuts against the um, lateral process of the calcaneus. That prevents further um, pronation. But this happens in different people at different times. And as your medial structures are weak, you can maximally over pronate more. So when you get orthotic, the idea is that it holds the heel and stops the to ortho uh, to evert to this region. You could do similarly with an internal implant, which would make a new maximal pronation point, stop the foot pronating so much, and stop putting so much pressure through the um, medial structures. So this is known as doing an arthroeresis. So you can see that, look at the declination of the talus here. You can see that by putting the arthroeresis in and not much else, that the position is now improved the declination is improved. Similarly, it can improve the midfoot um, abduction. Only to a certain extent though, um, probably around 30%. I think more than that, you're going to struggle. So what is the role of arthresis? Um, one of my colleagues, Alessio Bernasconi, he was my registrar before, and we've written a chapter on minimal invasive flat foot reconstruction, which should be available quite soon through clinics in North America. Um, he initially did this EFORT review on arthresis in children and adults. And his main points were that it's been reported to be minimally invasive, effective and low risk. However, the evidence is really poor. There's only really case series. and It's difficult to make strong recommendations. Pain around the area of the, the device is the most common complication. And this often requires removal. 20% to 50%, depending on who you ask. Um, there's a number of types of procedures and it's usually done based on surgeon preference. So it's difficult from this, from the evidence there to say that, look, this is a great idea. We should be adding this to all flat foot reconstructions. But I think more and more people are finding that it does work in that way to protect the position and make it better and probably works better in conjunction with the rest of a flat foot reconstruction rather than as an independent procedure. So the best way to look at, look, is this procedure good is to look at some comparative with some other form of procedure. And it seems that the most common thing that's been compared to is what is called a lateral column lengthening. Now, I think you guys need to know what a lateral column lengthening is as well. 
and it's, it's a procedure for the midfoot abduction. The heel valgus is well corrected with a calcaneal osteotomy, but this lateral column lengthening type osteotomies are much better for correcting forefoot abduction. I'm going to tell you about it when we talk about stage two. But for stage one, let's just talk about the um, comparison with this orthoresis screw that we're talking about. So if you look at a study of them, the studies will generally say that the lateral column lengthening group achieves better radiographic correction and better functional scores. They've got more complications um, and reoperation rates are similar, although reoperations for orthoresis are removal of a small screw as opposed to a fusion and non-union surgery, lots of things. But they, it sounds like lateral column lengthening is better. To really get into this, and you've got to look at a bit more detail, and this is probably the newest paper on it from some very well-known uh, Singapore, Singaporean uh, foot and ankle surgeons. And they looked at theirs, and they, they, give, they give a very similar um, outcome to the first paper. They look carefully at the results. Actually, visual analog score hind foot, no difference between the procedures. AOFAS hind foot score, no difference between the procedures. Midfoot visual analog score, so you know, not a particularly strong measure. They've gone from six and five to 0.5 and one. So although statistically significant, pain's really low in both groups. Similarly, the AOFAS midfoot scores have gone from 45 to 80 and 90. There's not a lot between the two procedures in the fact they both give quite significant improvements. Similarly, when you look at radiological angles, you know, in, in this study, there was no difference in the post-op calcaneal pitch, uncoverage, cuneiform height. So the arthrosis probably is, is similar in efficacy, I would say, to the lateral column lengthening. And as you see the different procedures, you might see why I prefer the arthrosis in the majority of flat fit. So the arthrosis goes into the sinus tarsi. It's important to make a two, three centimeter incision, move the sinus tarsi contents out of the way if they're in the way, then they can get pushed into the sinus tarsi and pinch and cause pain. You simply put it into the sinus tarsi under direct vision, position it just under the tailor neck. There's some sizers with the self-locking implants. That's what I use. And size it eight or size nine, you can feel a tight fit and you shouldn't see the subtalar joint opening up on x-ray. That suggests it's too tight. You get a good fit in here and that's it. Really quite straightforward. So that's my addition. So it'd be a tip post tendinoscopy proximal medial gastroc release, and an arthrosis would be the things I'd do for a stage one. Now, stage one is not common, and it's not common to need surgery, but that would be how I would, that sort of sporty patient, getting tip post pain, getting dynamic um, pronation pain, that's what the management plan would be. Much more common in stage two, and stage two is huge, right? So you need to do something about the Achilles again. So remember what I was saying about the, proximal medial gastroc release, the positioning, they've got to be almost prone. If I'm doing calcaneal osteotomies, other procedures, I need the patient lateral supine. So it's much easier for me to do the strayer procedure. Once I'm adding a calcaneal osteotomy and they're going into cast for a couple of weeks anyway. So it works really well. Tip post debridement and repair. So similar sort of thing as we discussed for stage one. Realignment, dependent on the heel valgus midfoot abduction. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the different ways of realigning. We've already gone through arthrosis, which is one. There's two other osteotomies, a medial side calcaneal shift and a lateral column lengthening. I'll explain both of those to you and when we'd use those procedures. FDL transfer. Now that's, that was the first thing that Johnson Strom did for flat foot, for posterior tendon, tendon deficiency. Is that a good idea? I'm gonna give you some food for thought on that. Spring lig ligament reconstruction the static stabilizer of the medial column, are they important? How can we, can we deal with them? And finally, addressing the compensatory forefoot supination. So this kind of all follows Blumen and Myerson's stage two, A, one, two, B, C. But we'll just, we'll just talk about it broadly here and then you can go back and piece it all together. So calcaneal osteotomy. Um, so this is what Myerson added. An incision over the back of the heel, move the perineals and hopefully the serial nerve forward. Cut the calcaneus um, along the tuberosity at 45 degrees. Shift it across medially, hold it with a with screws or even a step plate because the step plate's got a distance on it, tells you that you're removing it. So what's the issues with doing calcaneal osteotomy? Like it's quite hard. It's quite hard to actually shift this. You break the bone, 
and it's so firmly fixed on the medial side, you really struggle. So you've got to lever it open with some um, osteotomes. Uh, you've got to lever it open with some laminar spreaders, and you've got to really work hard. And that's why people use the step plate stuff to to get it um, to make sure that you're getting the shift that you want. And then secondly, there's the serial nerve. So is the serial nerve at risk? Yes, it is. I know this because many, many years ago, just when I started orthopedic surgery, uh, way back in, I think this was 2008, I was working in Glasgow and I looked at Central Kumar series of calcaneal osteotomies and the sort of tagline was, what were the complications? And the most worrying complication in about 10 to 15% of patients was a um, serial nerve palsy. So as many years later, I became a foot and ankle surgeon myself. It's not something that I was, I wanted to have serial nerve neuromas. And so I learned the minimally invasive calcaneal osteotomy. So if you look at Harvinder Betty's paper um, from Melbourne, you find that really doing it minimally invasively allows for a huge shift, more so than open. And you kind of wonder, well, how do you get such a big shift doing it minimally invasively? It's because of the rotating burr we use is, removes bone as it goes. So when you cut it with a three mil burr, you take three mils of bone out and that shortening of the bone is enough to make it actually quite straightforward. You can get really, really big shift, average 16 mils. And similarly, there's no neurovascular wound complications. So if you make a sort of one centimeter incision, carefully dissect down to bone and put your burr in, it's quite safe. And you can see there's a safe zone here. So I usually use a use a burr like this, a rotating burr, but I'll place a wire, I'll keep that wire under the skin and make sure that it works as a landmark. I'll cut up and down and then I'll shift and fix. And you can see here that they've got quite a big shift. One thing you may notice is they've um, ended up with a bit of a quinus here. This, this top tuberosity has moved proximal a little. So that's why I always do my strayer procedure first. It reduces the risk of a quinus, unless we pull it down and you know, rebuild the heel position. And that's one osteotomy. But then what's the problem with the medial slide? If you look at it here, it does not correct forefoot abduction. So if you've got those patients who've got heel valgus and forefoot abduction, a medial slide osteotomy alone will not correct it. So to be honest, this is why I use the arthoresis. They've not mentioned the arthoresis on the slide, but it does correct forefoot abduction in quite a straightforward fashion up to a certain point. The only time I've not managed to correct the forefoot abduction with a arthoresis was in a pediatric patient who had um, spasticity in his foot. He initially had cerebral palsy and had a, a spinal, de de his nerves had been cut um, to, get, to get rid of the spasticity. And he had significant flat feet. He was maybe 60, 70% abducted. So the arthoresis corrected his talus on the lateral position, but didn't correct the abduction. And that's, and that's when these really powerful procedures come in, the lateral column lengthenings. Now, the lateral column lengthening, um, we're going to talk about the hintum and the evans and the difference. We're not going to talk about the calcaneal cubit arthrodesis. You can basically fuse a joint and put a bone graft in. It over lengthens, it causes pain, it causes non-union. It's not really something that people do nowadays more so it's Evans and Hinton. So why are we doing the column lengthening? If you look here, the idea is the medial column's too long, the lateral column's too short. So you want to lengthen the lateral column, shorten the medial or shorten the medial column and bring it back to a neutral position. The difference between the Evans and Hinton is where the osteotomy exits. So the Evans is a classic procedure and exits between the anterior and middle facet. There's two problems with this. Although in a picture, they look like two facets, they're kind of joined. So you always end up snapping through the cartilage and you also end up with quite a small fragment, it ends up quite unstable. And you frequently get what's this calcaneal cuboid subluxation and early arthritis. So the more modern way is this, through the sinus tarsi approach, right in front of the posterior facet, right across, you've got a big piece there, an opening wedge here. And this doesn't cause the same sort of issues. Um, looking at some studies between the Evans and the Hintemann osteotomy, you can see that the levels of arthritis were much higher after the Evans, more so than the Hintemann. And the 
conclusion was that there's less arthritis after implement. So if you remember to, to early in the series, I showed you the Muller Wise case that's coming up. I'm going to do a Hinterman lateral coil lengthening for him because his navicular squeeze down. There's no way I'm going to, be able to twist him around that without either massively lengthening his medial or shortening his medial column or lengthening him there. Similarly with pediatric cases, but an adult flat foot, I think this is it's quite a big operation. As you can see, the complications are there. And I think the orthoresis just works better in my hands. So I use the medial calcaneal shifting osteotomy for heel valgus, and I use the orthoresis for abduction and tailored declination. The other option would be one of those lateral column lengthenings. For the exam, um, the lateral column lengthening is probably the more classic one. If you can bring up the Hinteman one, I think that'd be pretty pretty advanced. What about FDL? So this is the first thing that Johnson and Strom talked about. But you, you have to wonder, this is probably the longest part of the operation, the biggest cut going in, debriding the tip poles, taking it out, moving the FDL. But the tip post, when you put the FDL in, it doesn't really add much mechanically to the strength. And actually, possibly, it gives more inversion strength just where it is and not transferring it. So I used to transfer it into the navicular um, and stitch it onto the tip post. Then I uh, met with Victor Valdebrano and the sort of um, Ibra group, European group. I started moving on to their method, which was taking the FDL, pulling under tension and stitching it side to side to tip post. And that to me seemed like a better option because you then you're not cutting the, the FDL, so it's still got its normal function. And you're just basically using it to augment the tip post. So once you've done your mechanical corrections, hopefully it can then work together with the tip post to give you that medial strength. And now to be honest, I'm moving more towards focusing on the spring ligament and just scoping the tip post and debriding it and just leaving the FDL where it is because I feel that's the, the bit that they take the longest to recover from. I'm not sure how much it adds. I'm going to give you more evidence for that philosophy in a little bit. And this is what we were just talking about there. Rosenfeld study showed that if you preserve the PTT tendon rather than cutting it out and just repair it onto the, um, the, the, the FDL onto the tip post, you get a better result than cutting it and removing the tip post. I mean, you guys are exam level, a lot of you, you'll want to know how to do this operation. So basically you've got attenuated tip post. You make a large medial incision from the, you want to center it on the navicular, not end, not end of the navicular so that you can then get right down to the knot of Henry. And so that you can then actually feed your, your FDL transfer into the bone. You want to follow this right up behind the medial malleolus. You then want to come down through the skin and fascia onto the tip post, usually it's swollen. You open up the sheath, you take, you debride the tendon back. As I said, there's no evidence that removing the damaged tendon is a good thing. So unless it's torn, I think I would, I would say that I would leave that completely. You've then got to feel underneath the tip post and make a little pocket, feel your finger. It's sort of at the, just proximal to the big car, you can fall into a little pocket that you open up and you'll find the FDL there. From the exam point of view, it's worth sort of being cagey that admitting that it's somewhat challenging to find the FDL and that you just have to carefully dissect, fall into a pocket as it goes deep into the foot and find it. Because when you start off, it's quite difficult to find the tendon. So once you find the FDL, um, you release it way down here at the knot of Henry, not at the navicular, fall it right down to the knot of Henry, there's a leash of vessels here, carefully buzz those vessels and cut the FDL at that point. Then bring the FDL into the wound, take the stump of the FDL that's there. You can re repair that to your flexor halluses to give that more strength. And then through this drill hole that you made in the navicular, pass your new FDL tendon and fix it on both ends with a knot. And when you wanna fix this, you can either bring it back and tie it on itself or you can use some form of interference screw. When I was doing this, I was using the Arthrex uh, swivel locks, which work quite nicely. You don't need as much length then. So this is the procedure for FDL reconstruction. But as I said, 
I think we'll be moving further and further away from that. What we think is more important now is this thing here. Well, this part of the calcaneo navicular spring ligament. So if we look at it, the spring, the main part of the spring is this bit here. But I would say to you that the tip post insertion is also partly spring ligament, all the way down onto this cuneiform first metatarsal. Deltoid is also part of this ligamentous structure. I think we have to, you know, think more about the important bits here. So when they first developed the internal bracing of spring ligament, as, as it's called, they put two limbs, one from the top, one from the bottom, because that follows the sort of natural, you know, angulation of this tendon. Sorry, ligament. And then the chap I was talking about before, he did a lot of work on this, uh, Chandra Pasapula. He, he did a biomechanical study looking at the spring ligament. So he put the foot on his tensiometer and sequentially cut the tib post, cut the spring ligament itself, and then did a number of tests, including First of all, he just repaired the spring ligament. Then he didn't repair the spring ligament and did an FDL reconstruction with or without an internal brace and then cut the different limbs of the internal brace over eight, 16 cadavers, basically two sets of both to show which structures are important. And I sort of come to the conclusions. You can go and look at the paper if you want the real details, but the conclusions are the ligament alone offers little, little resistance. So once you've got a stretching tear, just putting stitches back in, it doesn't really make it strong. The FDL transfer adds little biomechanic stability to a spring ligament construct. So although that's the bigger part of the operation and it's fun to do and you find the tendon, you repair it and everything, it looks nice, it doesn't actually add much strength. Similarly, the top limb of the internal brace doesn't add very much. So really most of the strength comes from putting a structure so when he cut this one and the, the only thing left remaining was this planter branch here that was enough to give maximum stability so immediately i think that's one of the more important things and more recently there's very very little information on this but should we be doing a deltoid and spring ligament reconstruction down to the medial side and people are doing this you can see here's a cadaveric version where you've got tape coming from tibia to talus, tibia to calc, calc to navicular, calc to navicular, and you can even bring this further down to strengthen the inside. I think that's where the most modern literature is going to go. But for you guys, it's, I guess it's appreciating that FDL is maybe not so important. Spring ligament deltoid is important and assessing for that clinically and considering doing something about it or even mentioning that in the exam that you'd be focusing on the spring ligament, not just the to be as posterior tendon. And for me, just out of interest, I'd like to try and do this thing percutaneously. There's some studies doing the deltoid percutaneously, not yet the spring ligament. That was my plan this summer was to go back to the lab and do this in a bunch of cadavers. But obviously with COVID, I've been stuck in London. So I still don't know if it's possible to do the spring ligament percutaneously because that would avoid a large medial approach getting in there and, and getting behind the tendon. I think I can fish around the tendon to fix these. So I'll, I'll feed back to you in a few years. So let's move on to the forefoot condition. So we talked about that. The, I showed you before the excessive supination at the forefoot. If that's the case and you're worried that it's going to be an issue, a cotton osteotomy is the way to manage this. So it's a mid cuneiform osteotomy. You basically find the cuneiform, do this under x ray. Don't try and do it through your medial approach that you used to do the tip post. I know because I've done it and it ends up being way too medial and you end up having to really plane upwards to get onto it. So better just to come down and make a, a separate incision, four or five centimeters based on the cuneiform, x-rays to make sure both sides is, and just using a saw cut down to the planter base, top to bottom. Best to have a nice laminar spreader to stretch this open because it's quite hard to open it without and once you open it, you want to be able to open it enough so you can wedge a plate in. This is my preference. Is the, these are the Arthrex um, opening wedge plates. They come in different sizes. I'll basically put the biggest one I can in. Usually it's a six or an eight. I'll stretch out, get an idea, put the plate on. And th these screws are um, 
they allow you to change the position. So you want to converge them in the way so that they don't affect your um, your cuneiform position. They, they sit nicely and don't affect your joints. Other options are these um, wedges. You can get these wedges made of sort of tantalum. I worry about these things. I've never used a, a tantalum wedge in any operation. I mean, I'm sure it's really nice and easy to do, but what if it's sore and it has to come out and it's, it's filled in the bone? It's really, I know that I can take a plate out. So for me, I tend to use plates, but these, these things are there. They can wedge them out and they give really good stability. Plantar gapping, we talked about before, lapidus procedure. So there's a number, of, a number of ways of doing the lapidus procedure. The classic one is a dorsal medial approach. And I used to hate this approach because that area where that plate goes is right where the tibant tendon comes. So you've got to always peel the tendon back so you can get into the joint, clear and put this plate on. And also, if you think about it, there's gapping at the plantar area. When you walk on it, that's where it's going to gap. I'm not convinced of the stability of the dorsal medial plate. And most people aren't. So that's why the much more common thing now is a plantar plate. Um, Christian Platts and the Medartus group sort of really popularized this plantar plate, but all companies make them now. You just got to change where your approach is, come in from underneath. You need quite a long approach to do this, to get around underneath and still keep out of the way of the tib and prepare. And th this is super stable. You can walk on this if you do a nice plantar plate. So I like this, but um, personally for the lapis, I use the lapis nail. Um, I like it because it's minimally invasive, stays out of the way of the tib and, and gives ex excellent intraosseous compression. So I can get them to walk on it and they, they generally fuse without any issue. As long as these screws are on either side of the joint, if you malposition your nail and these screws cross the joint, then they'll be holding it open, it won't fuse. So it's technically a bit challenging, but I quite like it. Those are our procedures for stage two. St stage two is the most complex. You want to really think through each deformity, think through, look, what's going on? You know, Achilles is tight, yes. Okay, I'm going to do something about that. How much valgus is the heel in? The heels and valgus, it's mobile. That's why it's stage two. I'm going to manage that. Let me look at the abduction. Let me look at the forefoot supination. Let me consider the spring ligament. Let me see the strength of the tib post and make a plan, which will be calcaneal osteotomy plus minus arthrosis or lateral columning if there's lateral column lengthening, if there's abduction, medial procedures, whether that's FDL transfer plus minus inter, um, spring ligament reconstruction of some kind. And finally, looking at your forefoot and whether you're going to do something called an osteotomy or a, a lapis procedure to repair that. Lots and lots and lots going on. Stage three, I mean, things are going to get a bit more straightforward now. Stage three, double or triple fusion, medial or dual incision approach, or even arthroscopic. For this, I'll do a Hulk procedure. Got enough going on with the double, triple fusion. They'll be in a cast for six weeks. I'm not doing this unless it's something complex or an older patient. So, you know, the, uh, an Achilles mild weakness is not a big issue. So a simple Hulk procedure, triple lengthening. Start off with that, loosens everything up, makes everything a lot easier. So double or triple fusion. Double fusion means tail and navicular joint, subtalar joint. Triple fusion means tail and navicular, subtalar, and calcaneal cuboid. Once you fuse even one of these joints, tail and navicular, subtalar, you've you take the motion from 100% down to 10, 20% or less. So once you fuse both of them, the calcaneal cuboid doesn't add much. I'd only consider fusing the calcaneal cuboid personally in an inflammatory condition where that joint is particularly painful along with the other ones. And even then, I'd think about it. But generally, you fuse two of them. I like to fuse two of them almost always because if you imagine, if you just fuse tail and navicular, the minute you let them walk on it, they're trying to twist around on a subtalar joint. Same with subtalar, they're trying to twist around on tail and navicular joint. I think it's going to increase your risk of non union. And there's studies showing that. So, and to get a really good correction, clearing out at least two of those joints helps. So, I would say personally, double fusion. And let's talk about dual incisions or the medial mipple. So, dual incisions means coming on the lateral side making an incision, clearing out the subtalar joint, clearing out the calcaneal cuboid joint, and coming immediately. If you're doing this, I would suggest you use a dorsal approach to get to the tail and navicular joint. It's a much more pleasant approach coming just medial to tibant, 
you can see a lot more of the joint and you prepare most of the top surface and it's easier to correct than coming from a direct medial approach, trying to correct just it medially, getting sort of stuck at the end and struggling to bring it around. So dorsal approach is nice. So if you're doing a dual approach, I would do that. What are the downsides of the dual approach? The biggest thing in flat foot is think of the concavity and convexity of your deformity. So the cave that you're working into is on the inside. So if you make a large lateral approach, do 70% of your operation and most of your bone is removed from the lateral side, number one, as you bring it straight, you've kind of got a big gap that you've made from the lateral side. You've got a full graft. And secondly, you've got this huge gaping wound that's going to close under tension and be the biggest worry for you of the operation. Whereas when you do a medial approach, number one, you're clearing out the bit that you're closing. So you're just naturally, as you're clearing your joints, making a space to reduce your deformity into. And secondly, because you're closing into your concavity, actually, you're, that's where you've got the most room. You're moving everything away. The lateral skin's tight, but that's closed, and you've made a big gaping, gaping area immediately that's nice and easy to close. The difficulty with the dual medial approach is, yeah, the nerves and tendons are there. You've got to know where they are. You've got to move them out of the way. And you're not used to seeing the subtalar joint from medially. So when you come medially, you clear out the tail and navicular joint, you come under the head of the talus, and then you come across the middle facet of the calcaneus. And from there, you've got to work your way back to the posterior facet. Another tip that I'm sure some of you guys know, but it's worth knowing for the exam. How do you know you've cleared your subtalar joint? So when you come from the outside, from this approach here, you come through the skin, the fascia, you come onto the EDB muscle, you split that, and then you come into your subtalar joint. You start clearing, you start clearing. How do you know when you've done enough, when you've come medially enough? Because these are all small, dark places. So the answer is the FHL tendon. The FHL tendon is medial just under the sustentacum tailor. And as you keep clearing, keep clearing, you come to the FHL and you go, right, that's me done enough medially, and you're front and back. Subterror joint, you only need to do posterior facet. You don't need to do all the facets. So, you know, I try and do as much as I can see, but the main one's posterior. Medially, again, you've got to make sure you get back into the posterior facet. Once you get going, you get a good view. So that's what I do. And then finally, there's arthroscopic. Um, arthroscopic triple orthodesis. The nice thing is that you can clear the joints from inside, get rid of all the ligaments and tendons, and then sort of position it where you want it to fix it. Um, a lot of these patients are elderly, they've got terrible skin, um, that your biggest worry is the wounds, you know, they're inflammatory. So, the, the, I mean, this is, the level of evidence we're talking for this is basically, this is a technical note, and that's as much as we have. Anthony Pereira does this, he's presented on it a fair bit, but hasn't really published yet, and not many of us are doing this. So, I, I would say that this is specifically something that's there for if the skin quality is poor, you know, you've got an old person, poor skin quality, which is when you're doing a flat uh, fusion. So it's something to keep in mind, but you know, it's not, it's not in the mainstream yet. The, the big one in the mainstream would be the medial double. I would, I would discuss that for sure. So finally, we're kind of getting near to the end here, guys. You've got stage four. Stage four, hope procedure, because you're going to do something big. As Stage three, if it's a fixed deformity, i.e. double, triple, arthroscopic, medial, lateral, or stage two, if it's a flexible deformity, calcaneal osteotomy, arthresis, lateral column lengthening, cotton osteotomy, lapidus, whatever you need to do there. Then you've got to think of what you're going to do with the tibial tailor joint. A pan tailor fusion, where you fuse all the way around, really gives you poor function, extremely poor function. It does give you a stable base, though. So if you've got somebody in their 80s, Foot's going sideways, ankle valgus, lots and lots of pain. Just by positioning the foot under the ankle kind of works like wearing a prosthesis that's part of them, right? So they've got prosthesis attached to the bottom. It's, it, it'll allow them to transfer nicely. So there's still a role for a hind foot nail and tail navicular fusion. But generally, this is where we're getting to discussions about ankle replacements. Yeah. And this is not just for the low functioning old person, this is for in this condition. If you're doing all this stage two, stage three stuff, you should really be considering an ankle replacement. So if you look at it here, this is one you've got ankle valgus, not too bad, 10 degrees or so. You've got subfibular impingement. You can see that the tail is starting to bash into the fibula. 
If we look at the lateral, we can see the Taylor sublux forward. We've broken the Mary's angle there. There's Again, it's not, although there's a drop at the tail and navicular joint, there's another one at the tail at the navicular cuneiform joint. So there's also ongoing medial structural deficits. And looking at the AP, you can see quite significant tail arm coverage. So you think, well, an arthrosis isn't going to fix that. It's more than halfway. Either we've got the lateral column lengthening, or we've got to think about something more to bring that right round. So what did she have? So rather than lateral column lengthening, uh, medial structures, triple, fu triple fusion. So you can see here, there's been, there's, there's screws across the uh, tail and navicular, um, yeah, subtalar joint, calcaneal you know, cuboid staples. Staples are always nice. There's been some ligament reconstructions, right? So if you look at this um, large screw here, this is probably an Achilles allograft. Yeah, doing a deltoid reconstruction. Here, there's a screw from a, another grafted lateral ligament reconstruction to so it solidify everything. And in this case, to keep the talus in joint, they've actually popped a, a wire in from tibia to talus, and they'll keep that in for six weeks. So this will be very rarely done, but it's an idea that you don't always have to do something about the ankle. You can try to reconstruct it. You know, younger patient, no ankle pain. I don't know, there's, there's very limited indications. But the idea here is they've done the stage three operation for the hind foot, something else for the ankle moving on from that this one they've done the stage two operations calcaneal osteotomy um possibly a medial reefing and reconstruction of deltoid and here they've done a opening wedge to square at the ankle syndesmotic reconstruction and an ankle replacement so this is this is a mix of ankle replacement and corrective surgery for the fit and this is a mix of fusions and ankle replacement so when you get to stage four, the thing is, is the ankle correctable? Will it just correct by doing some soft tissue procedures along with your stage two, three operations? Or do you have to think about an ankle replacement? And this is probably one of the better indications for an ankle replacement. So that covers pretty much all of flat fruit from early to late. Quite a lot of uh, content to cover. Um, so I guess in conclusion for the exam, just sort of think of all the deformities. Think of your examination. A lot of your exams may be based on examining the different parts of the deformity, fixed, flexible, hind foot, mid foot, forefoot, and ankle, and then have some sensible plans for management. Always start with conservative, and there's some operative techniques for you as well. Thanks a lot, guys. I'll, I'll take some questions now if you have some. Thank you, Robbie. Fantastic presentation, comprehensive, and I'm sure this is going to be one of the most comprehensive lectures to be on the internet. At least for two to three years. <laughs> okay. topic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A few questions. Uh, one is how do you pick a patient in a stage one? Of course, there's going to be some medial pain. And is a single leg raise the key examination to pick in stage one? Yes. So it's a really good question. How do you pick a patient or how do you find a patient? In stage one because i'll tell you in our normal clinical practice we won't see many patients in stage one but there are quite a lot of patients out there in stage one they just by the time they make it to see an orthopedic surgeon things have usually progressed or gotten better so a patient in stage one there's there's two different um types of patient who have this stage one one is as i mentioned briefly in talk inflammatory patients totally different kind of patient somebody that's got psoriatic arthropathy, rheumatoid arthritis, they've got all kinds of different foot deformities, but they've got significant proliferative synovitis within the tendon. And that's one group. That's not what you're, you're asking about. You're asking about the early tib post dysfunctions. So these patients are usually 35, 40 year old runners that have got a little bit of flat foot or even the dynamic flat foot. So they'll come complaining of this pain on the inside the examination is examining the tendon as we discussed, palpating along the line of the tendon, getting them to invert against resistance. And like you said, it's the tiptoe test, but it's not, the, it's not the standard one. So it's not just a case of up in your tiptoes, does it correct or not? They go up in a dual leg stance, it will correct. They go up in a single leg stance, it will correct. But then you say, okay, just gently put your hands on the wall and keep going up and down 
on that same foot to tiptoe again and again. And you, you set your timer for 30 seconds and watch how they go. And after 10, 12 seconds, they'll, they'll tire out and they'll say, it's getting quite sore, I'm getting really fatigued. You say, do it on the other side and they can easily do it for 30 seconds. So the tendon fatigues easily gets weak. That, that's, the, that's how I would diagnose it. Treatment would be physiotherapy, kinesio taping, rest, and then it would be the, like I said, arthrosis, arthroscopy, a bunch of things you can do for it if it's not settling. Basically, you're looking at fatigue, isn't it? Fatigue. That, that's the bottom line. You're looking at the early fatigue in that tiptoe test. So you have to do it for more than when you do it for a more severe one. You notice very early. They can't come up on tiptoes. Or as they go up on tiptoes, they go about halfway. The heel just stays in valgus. For these ones, they will trick you by being able to do it quite easily and then fatiguing quite quickly. So how long do you recommend them to do it? For 30 seconds or one minute? I mean, I would say 30 seconds. Within 30 seconds, you'll know. If they, can do, if they can do 30 seconds, you know, that's 10, 15 reps at least. It's not that, that much of a problem. And the other question is, does it, is it common to see it in both the feet? Yes. So the, nobody knows like what sets the condition off. I guess a lot of the patients I see have had familial flat feet. You know, it's something that they've, they've always had arches on the side, you know, on the more planus side rather than cavus side, but then suddenly one of them has gotten a little bit worse. I mean, with women, the menarche is a big thing. Ligaments get lax and things start to flatten out. And I'm not sure why else it happens, but generally, I mean, usually I'll do one side. So I won't see patients coming in for bilateral, but I'll do one and quite frequently they'll come back six months, a year later, the other side. So it is commonly bilateral. Thank you for that. The other question is, you mentioned about subtalar arthrosis. Now, what is the particular implant material that you keep it in the subtalar space? Yes, so it's important to note two things, material and where it goes. It does not go into the subtalar joint. It sits in the sinus tarsi. So it, it's, um, it's, I mean, the most common ones are titanium, although some people use steel screws in a different way. The most modern ones are all titanium and they're fixed into the sinus tarsi space. And I think I showed a picture. All we do is when a patient's dynamically walking, it stops them over pronating. So it butts against that soft screw rather than butting, a butting bone on bone. Um, it might sound painful abutting into the screw, but if they're not abutting into the screw, those surfaces are abutting to take them to maximum length. So it just stops them from getting to that, to that level. Um, there's some technical things about sizing and not pushing a lot of structures into the sinus tarsi, which I think reduce the removal removal rates. But the quoted removal rates are up to 50% or more. What are the sizes that are available? Um, the sizes come from a six up to about an 11, but almost all adult males are nine, and adult females are sizes eight and nine, and then children are sizes six and seven. So there's a whole sizing thing that you put in but there, 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 there never really is a clear mechanism for sizing it's not a length thing that you put it in you go right it's exactly 12 you put it in and then where, it's a bit like when you do a i guess when you're sizing a hip stem when you when you're when you're sizing a hip stem for diameter you try the extra system zero one two you just get an idea that this one fits quite nicely it's not super tight and it's not really loose I guess it's a bit like that. You, you get a feel that you put it in, you put it to the distance that you want under imaging and you look at it, the, the, the foot is corrected at that position um, and it's not jacking open the joint and you go, right, this is the first size that's correcting it. I'm going to take that one. So usually a size nine. Thank you for that. The other question is, you mentioned about a comparative study between lateral column lengthening and subtalar arthrosis. Is it level one data that you quoted or lower down? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's a the, 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 the most recent study from Singapore, it is definitely comparative data, i.e. they've done two series. I can't remember off the top of my head whether they randomized them, I think they did, or whether they just did one series and did the other series. But I agree that would obviously make a difference because if you're choosing your patients for one procedure or the other. Um, 
I think that the, the main thing to say about those two procedures, lateral column lengthening is a much bigger operation. It's a lot more destructive and the complications from it are probably a lot more. That's why I prefer against it. However, that's a classic operation that's been around in Western circles, in American literature, in British literature for 50 or 60 years. And if you get abduction deformity in the British exam, you'd, you'd, you'd go down a better road talking about lateral column lengthening rather than arthresis, because although it's very popular and there's literature in France, Italy, Spain, not so much in the UK, better talking about that and better taking your discussion towards why you think the Hinteman procedure is better than the Evans, because the evidence shows you get less arthrosis from that procedure. That would be a much easier exam for you if that's what you suggest. The, the, the person would be much more impressed with your answers if you if that if that's the road you go down rather than take down the arthrosis route, which I think is valid, but maybe not the best for British level exam. Now you mentioned the uh, Hinteman over the events. Is that is the reason because you get a slightly longer length with the Hinterman compared to events? Yes, I think that there's two things. You go the 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 difference is that the Hinterman goes between the posterior facet and middle facet, where there definitely is a space, so you're not breaking through a joint. Number one, number two, it just makes sense that if you split two bones into two bigger pieces, both bits are going to be more stable. And there, there are some bifurcate type ligaments in the subtalar joint that are probably going to be less affected if you maintain the anterior middle facet as one piece. So as long as you've got a hinge, if you look at x-rays of a Hinteman afterwards, it kind of looks like a, a calcaneus, whereas the Evans always looks like the front bit's just popped up in the air a little bit. And that's where they get 50, 60% rates of calcaneal cuboid arthritis afterwards. So I think that the Hinteman, I think it's more stable you know, once you get your head around the plane of the osteotomy, I think it's, it's, it, it will probably become the more common way this operation is done. The other one is how do you fix both? Like Evans and Hinterman, what is the better fixation? So again, the depends on your, if, you, if it's adult or pediatric. So pediatrics are very common, you know, they're very big on bone grafts. So a lot of them will be a bit of iliac crest and like in a wire. I mean, for me, I don't like iliac crest bone graft. It's quite an invasive operation to do. You know, you, you can get these, you know what I showed for the cotton osteotomy, a step plate. You can basically wedge it open and put a step plate in there, scrape a little bit of calcaneus out of your calcaneal medial slide osteotomy and just use that as the bone graft. The natural force of the body to try and close the osteotomy against the wedge will, will um, make it heal. So a small, a small opening wedge plate would be quite, would be how I would do it, how I do it. And one last and final question before we conclude. You mentioned that uh, one way to treat this in the early phase is to augment the tibialis posterior with the FDL, isn't it? So basically yes. you're looking at a side-to-side -side tenography, isn't it? Yes. So so what I was what I was getting at there was I told you why I'm moving away from the FDL reconstructions, but if I am doing it now, <laughs> I've got it open in front of me. The side-to-side tenorafi with the FDL under tension seems to be less destructive than cutting it at the knot of Henry, damaging those blood vessels, drilling the navicular, fixing it there under tension where it's now been weakened by being cut. So side-to-side tenorafi onto the tip post rather than an FDL transfer, I would say is a, is a better option for that part of the operation. But the, the key take-home message is that the spring ligament is probably more important. The deltoid spring medial ligamentous structures are probably more important than the tendinous structures. And you should focus on examining them and having a plan to reconstruct them at the same time as your, as your tendinous structures. So that means the distal most part of the tip post is usually good tendon, isn't it? Yes. And that's the, why we are able to do the tenorafi. Yeah, well, it, it depends. I'm sorry, if, it's, if the tip post is ruptured, say it's ruptured in the middle, then it's gone. You can't really tenorafi at that point. If it's a proper rupture, I would put it into the navicular. But I would say once the tip post is ruptured, you're kind of moving into the stage threes. You don't, you don't have many 
nicely flexible ones. I have seen one or two, but generally when I'm seeing a ruptured tendon, it's where I'm doing my medial approach to fuse everything because it's everything's gone. Spring ligaments ruptured, tip post is ruptured. It's just this big fat stump with fluid. Usually when I'm reconstructing there, the tendon is still, it's swollen, it's degenerate, but it's still there. In that case, it should be better to have a long strip uh, repaired to each other, isn't it? FDL and the tibialis posterior. Yes, yeah, uh, along, along a long segment. So from malleolus to navicular repairing it side to side would be the plan. Okay, Robbie, I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for this fantastic and very, very comprehensive presentation on the adult acquired flat foot and tibialis posterior insufficiency. It was a pleasure listening to you. And of course, we can do one more lecture later on. Great, will do. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.